November! Thank you. Um, I give a talk about Borderlands and why it's actually a love story. Uh, if you didn't watch it, go and watch it on YouTube. I think it's, it's all right. I'm going to talk about game AI today because that's actually what I do in my day job. I'm a senior lecturer in computer science and I talk a lot about video games and artificial intelligence because that's my bag and I love it. And I want to talk about the fragile relationship that exists between players and opponents and all that jazz. But I've got to talk about reward first. Why have I talk about reward? Because video games are built around the principle of rewards. We execute actions of some sort and then we get reward for doing so. And the idea is that the more you do something and repeat a certain specific sequence of actions, you will then be rewarded and encouraged to continue to do so. It's actually also the same fundamental principle of how artificial intelligence works, which is why I find this so utterly fascinating. And I often, you know, point towards Super Mario games or pretty much anything by Nintendo whenever I'm talking about reward structures in games because Nintendo have an incredibly good idea of how to embed reward structures in their games. Collecting coins plays nice noises, you get little particle effects, you jump and you'll get that nice appealing jump sound. Why is it that everybody knows the jump sound to Mario? Because it's strangely appealing. Um, you collect enough coins, you grab mushrooms, you get extra lives. All this stuff has this really nice um, mechanic of embellishing itself and continuing to get you to execute it. And it's overall really wonderful. But it's not just about the basics of, you know, just collecting coins and grabbing mushrooms and, brruh, 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 and all that stuff. Because see, even then you remember that because you go, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, it also comes into, you have to inject some sort of challenge in order for that reward to be worthwhile. And so I'm going back to the first days of real non-player characters, and this is sort of Space Invaders, for any of the really young kids in the room who don't know what it is. Um, and the thing is that, particularly with Space Invaders, what's interesting about that is that you've now got this set of autonomous, well it's not actually autonomous, it's a set of scripted behaviours that are doing something specific and then you have to find a way to counteract it. Thing is, it's kind of boring because essentially they just kind of do this kind of evil thing where they come over and kind of shoot lasers at you and it's just this kind of evil space laser shooting crab which is in hindsight the worst sexually transmitted disease I've ever heard of. Um, but it's not that interesting. So this is where artificial intelligence of some sort comes into it. And then, of course, you have an image like this, which is this horrendous deviant art, deviant art image I found of Doom. But what's interesting about this is that you now have a sense of range of mechanics for non-player characters. You also have a sense of individual behaviours. If anyone's ever played Doom, you begin to look at that image and prioritise who you're going to kill. Um, and also this notion of having violence in games is really useful because it then projects this zero-sum game approach to in achieving a more embellished uh, reward system because if I kill everything, I win. But if I don't kill everything, I lose. So you have to then just look at that and go, I'm going to kill everything now. And for reference, I'm killing the Archvile first because he revives all the other ones. He's a pain in the ass. And so this is, yeah, this is where AI comes into it. Now, AI is such a big buzzword these days. In fact, the AI Summit ran as part of the London Gaming Festival yesterday. I couldn't make it because I've got a day job. And yeah, so like a short definition by myself, a software system that takes action after having made a rational, intelligent decision. Um, that's really important. Without those three, it's not actually an artificial intelligence. The big difference between that and actually machine learning is that it learns an appropriate action policy based upon the data that it has in the world. It's slightly different. And it's all about the information you have in the world, right? Now the thing is, that when you're doing this in games, it's not as clear cut as that. And this is kind of getting to the, the, the theme of Video Brains for this month, is that you need to have, you actually have this really awkward, contentious relationship between an artificial intelligence and the player. Because really, the AI actually has to empower the player in order for them to feel good about themselves and in order to really feel like they're actually achieving something in the game. But conversely, the AI is also supposed to kill you. So I'm holding your hand until I decide to change my mind and then stab you in the back or shoot you in the face. It's a kind of really weird thing. Now, this is kind of why I'm doing a talk like this, but I also run a YouTube channel to this effect, because this is actually really fucking hard. Like, artificial intelligence is built to develop the optimal solution to a given problem. But if I give you the optimal solution to shooting you in the head, I end up with like metric tons of Mountain Dew and Doritos getting spewed across for collective miles because everyone's going, that's not fair, that thing shot me in the head from three miles away with a pistol. Sorry, that was a Scottish chav. <laughs> that's no fair, mate. And so, yeah, this is a really, really hard problem to solve. But at the same, so now we have this whole thing of, I got to hold your hand a little bit, and then when I decide, right, now I'm going to kill you. 
and you've got to try and figure a way to work that out. Now, I kind of what I decided to do was kind of talk about some interesting examples of how this is approached in AAA games, and I broke it down into four distinct segments. First of all, I thought, companions. Companions are really cool. I love companions in games. And when people hear companions, they usually think of Alex from Half-Life 2, Garrus, because everyone wants to sleep with him, and, um, and Ellie from The Last of Us. But they're not exactly great examples of what I'm thinking of, because the three of them don't really have any sort of agency. Um, Garrus just kind of gets more, you know, grungy and moody the longer the Mass Effect trilogy goes on. And Alex is essentially there to just shepherd you from one point to the other and just kind of look pretty. I swear to God, I had so much trouble just trying to find one image of Alex Vance that some 12-year-old hadn't photoshopped. That's the, that was the hardest image for me to find, and that's why she's like on a mounted gun and everything, and good God. And... Funnily enough, one of the places that I find is really interesting to talk about this sort of stuff is Call of Duty. So this is from Call of Duty 2, where you are the Allied forces, and you're fighting off against large swathes of the Nazis, uh, the Nazi army, or as we call it these days, alt-right journalists. And the idea is that the, the, the actual non-player characters in Call of Duty 2 have this thing called a battle chatter system, which was really, really interesting. Um, they implemented 20,000 lines of dialogue so that these characters, as they're running along and then getting killed by an MG, will actually give you contextual information. There is, you know, some sort of nest over in this area. They've got, an M they've got like this large machine gun in a corner. You need to go and figure out what that is. He's not actually saying it to you as such. He's like, yo, Jake, there's like a large machine gun over there. You should really go over there because it's your job because you're the player. No, instead, they're kind of all dying around you, which is quite horrible. But at the same time, they're shouting about what it is that's trying to kill them. Ah, there's a large machine gun in the corner. Ah. And that makes you think, oh, there's a large machine gun in the corner. I'll go and take it out. And that's actually, for me, what Call of Duty, well, the earlier ones, actually did really well. In fact, one of my favorite examples of this, before it got very motion capture -y, was um, all gillied up in Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, because this is uh, McMullen, who's a right Scottish fella, who's taking you through a really Russian area so you can go and shoot a guy in the head with a sniper rifle. I love that mission because you can actually just ignore him. And um, you think you're going to turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger and just run in like, and take everything. No, you're not. You just die. You just die a lot and repeat. And what he's doing is he's shepherding you to these interesting decision points and then says, right, you can either take out the sniper or we'll go in the long way. It's your call. I don't know where that accent comes from in hindsight. I just replayed that mission recently. I was like, where's that from? But I love that because either way, whichever one you then decide, he'll go, all right, I'll support you in your decisions. I stand by you in this particular instance. <laughs> I don't think he actually says that, but I just kind of envisioned it in my head. And I really love that idea. One of my favorite ones of recent days, funnily enough, made by roughly the same people, is Titanfall 2. Any Titanfall 2 players in the room? Cool, a couple of you. Right, I'll avoid the spoilers. This is you. You are Pilot Jack Cooper. And not Scottish. Um, and that is BT, BT7274, he is your titan. You're actually bequeathed that titan by Captain Lasamosa because he dies and he gives it to you and says, you've got to complete the mission. Sorry, it's the first mission, I'm not spoiling anything. What's really interesting about that is that you're supposed to pilot that titan, but also when you're not in that titan, you feel terribly exposed, and that character is there to back you up. He actually gives a lot of covering fire. He'll help you and give information where necessary. There's also this really rich thing that happens on both a narrative and mechanic level that really, BT's actually the hero of the story, and all you're doing is making sure he gets there. And if you've actually played Titanfall 2, you might appreciate that. And if you don't, play it again and then pay attention to whether or not you're actually the protagonist of the narrative. I love this so much, and nobody actually notices it. Anyway, but also, um, one that actually gets, I think, way too much slack, way, way too much, no, sorry, not slack, the, um, the opposite, it gets too much criticism for what I think it does, is Elizabeth in Bioshock Infinite. I love this. It's so good. Um, John Abercrombie, who also developed the big, big Daddy in Bioshock, he um, did a GDC talk on this several years ago. Well worth checking out. And what it's about is trying to figure out how to make sure that Elizabeth has a sense of agency of her own, and she's trying to tell you things that are of relevance to you without it looking like she's following you. Like, constantly behind you going, did you see that thing over there? And what about this thing over here? Did you go and try that out? Look, there's ammunition. Instead, she's often in front of you, and she's going, have you seen this? And sometimes it can be ammunition. Sometimes it can be something that's pertinent to the current objective. But other times, just cool environment art. And she goes, 
isn't that beautiful, right? That's really interesting. And it draws your attention to something you might not have noticed because you're too busy being all, I'm going to shoot things with magic powers and sky hooks and whatever. And I really love that. She really tries to make you appreciate what's happening around you. Next up's adversaries. This one's quite quick, actually. And it's really about how non-player characters have these really interesting design decisions built into them to help you win. So First Encounter Assault Recon, that came out like 10 years ago. It's a game that everyone really loves, um, particularly about its AI. It was kind of heralded at its time for having great non-player character AI. It still kind of holds up, which is much a detriment and kind of a critique of the current state of the games industry, but I digress. The thing I love about these is that they're actually designed to minimize the threat that they are currently feeling rather than trying to kill you. So when they throw, knock down a table and jump behind a bookcase, they're not doing it because they're going, I must kill you. It's the player is going to kill me. What am I going to do? So sometimes they'll attack you, but other times they're defensive, purely because they're actually looking out for their own self-interests. Um, but only their own, which I'll come back to later. Um, the Batman Arkham series, uh, Rocksteady do some really cool stuff with this. And both the, the fighting modes as well as the, the um, stealth sequences. The fighting modes, one of the cool things is that all the AI mechanics in the Arkham series are also, this, the team that developed the AI are also the same people that develop all the actual mechanics for Batman. And they did that certainly in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Can't say for certain with Arkham Knight. However, what's cool about that is that that's why in the combat there is no move that a non-player character can commit that Batman can't counteract because they were always built in pairs. It was always meant to have this relationship of every time they go to get you, it's all right, I'm Batman, and you get them back. And similarly, when you're doing the stealth sequences, one of the big things they're trying to pay off is that I'm Batman thing you're wanting to go for. Um, Glaswegian Batman, clearly. Um, all right, mate. And uh, one of the cool things about this is that a lot of the non-player characters are designed such that they deliberately have flaws in them so that you can, you can uh, capitalize on that. For example, no character will backtrack unless it's absolutely necessary when they're patrolling an environment. Because there's nothing worse than when you're sneaking behind as Batman. I'm going to get you. Sorry. I'm going to get you. And then meanwhile, he's got his machine gun and goes, hup, hup, oh, Batman's dead. That really takes you out of that experience. And that's one of the reasons that they do that. But also things like Alien Isolation. Um, Alien Isolation is a wonderful game. I've actually talked a lot about this in a YouTube video I've done before. One of the cool things about hiding underneath all the furniture is that the designers can actually dictate which parts of the furniture the alien can't see you underneath. The reason for that is so you don't feel like you're being cheated all the time. So you're hiding underneath the table and you can see the alien going, I don't know if it can see me. And that one time it comes by. And you're like, shit, 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 shit. And it just goes, mm keeps going and you think oh thank god it's because the designers made sure it can't actually see you underneath that table sorry to break the illusion but it's kind of how it's working but even just simple things like this this is from middle earth shadow of mordor the nemesis system gives a sense of history and it empowers you by telling you you mate you came over and you slashed me in the face i'm gonna get you now no, they do actually sound like that it wasn't just i'm deliberately putting an english accent on this time and that's great because you go oh yeah i do remember you i'm gonna slash you again that doesn't sound right at all. I'd really apologize. Moving on. Next up is the illusion of coordination. Like, AI don't coordinate almost ever in AAA games. The reason being, it's actually a very difficult thing to manage, and it's a very time-consuming and resource-consuming process. Halo does this really well in Halo 2 and 3 specifically. They actually have these, what they call, stimulus behaviors injected into characters in Halo 2, such that if you do something in the game, it's a way to actually tell other characters how to react to events taking place in the world. One of the things that Bungie talked about extensively working on the first two Halo games, Halo? Halo games, was that when you shot an elite, all the grunts around them were supposed to go, Ah oh, no, I'm going to get killed, oh, no. And they do actually do that, but the level at which they had to force that into the game to get players to go, do you see this? Do you see this now? Do you see? Look, look, it's right there. Because for a lot of the times in the first game, no one actually noticed it. In the third game, they actually have it as a multiple wave process. That At the start, it's more like a dance that the characters all come in, they go, it's the demon, and they attack you. And the more you take them out, they begin to react and go, no, fall back, fall back. But they're not actually talking to each other. It's just a master AI system telling them what to do. Fear does exactly the same thing. One of the things that used to freak people out when they played fear is that one of them will go, get to cover, and the other one goes, OK, jumps behind a table. Actually, one of them decided to get to cover. He then told the squad AI system that exists above him, I'm going to get to cover. And it goes, okay, and it finds another character nearby. 
And it goes, you, I want you to say this line of dialogue. Why am I saying that? Just do it. Get to cover. And then the other one goes, okay. And you think, they're talking to each other. They're not, actually. Just one of them decided to make a decision, and then the parent system told the other one to pretend to tell him to do it. It's absolutely wonderful. I love it. But also things like Far Cry. This is Far Cry 4. Um, Far Cry 4 does this weird thing where the more characters are within proximity of the player, their accuracy and damage goes down. They actually become poorer at the game the more there are around you. So you're thinking, oh no, I'm absolutely surrounded. Meanwhile, they're all doing Stormtrooper. They're shooting everything but you. And then that's when you're running in with your elephant and you stab them and you shoot them and throw them, hit them with C4 or whatever, and you feel like a badass. So it's given this illusion of coordination, but at the same time empowering you. And then lastly, because I realize I'm really cutting it close with time, is direction. And so this is kind of like the last of the four that I could think of off the top of my head. And why these are really cool is that the direction helps the player feel like they're earning it. So I come back to Far Cry again. Far Cry does this really cool thing that actually no character exists within more than about, I think it's 150 to 200 meters of the player at any point in time. They only exist within this radius of you. Anything outside of that, the entire map is empty. You're thinking that Kirat's in Far Cry 4 is this rich and wonderful landscape and it's just a barren wasteland for like 99% of the playtime. And if you start driving away from an enemy because you think I've been overwhelmed, as soon as you get far enough away, the game goes, okay, and it starts picking all the characters out of the world. And it goes, well, you're never going to deal with him again. He's like two miles down the road in a jeep. And then it'll start putting them in front of you. And it goes, right, come on, right, well, yeah, we'll put them down there. And of course, they don't know this. They're just little AIs. They go, okay, I'm going to kill the character again. And so this whole thing of, it's actually more about managing memory. But at the same time, it helps manage that experience by not having it. You're getting po chased pointlessly for like 10 kilometers by that one guy in a jeep going, I'm going to get you. It's like, just going to fuck off, all right. Um... Meanwhile, Alien Isolation, this is wonderful, I love this. So the alien in Alien Isolation actually has two brains. It has a macro and a micro, a macro and a micro brain. The micro brain controls the alien itself. So it's the thing that's wandering around and it's being all creepy and all that sort of stuff. And every now and then when you make noises, it reacts to it. Because if you make a noise, it's... and then it'll come over and have a look and see what you're up to. And it always does it in a non-linear, random fashion. That way it looks like it's backtracking on itself and it's second-guessing itself. The other cool thing is the macro brain always knows where you are. And its job is to tell the micro brain where to go. So you're sitting there thinking, it can't see me. Meanwhile, there's the, br the brain going, all right, Tommy, how you doing down there? You feeling good? <laughs> Fuck off, I'm busy. And then what it does is it goes, hey, alien. The alien's like, what? Why don't you go over there? Why is the player there? I'm not telling you. And it goes, okay. And then it comes over here. And then you're like, shit. But similarly, it's actually got this thing in it called the Menace Gauge, which is actually based on Left 4 Dead, which is the next slide anyway. What it does is the longer the aliens around you, so say you guys are the player or something, and I'm just constantly doing this whole thing of tracking around you, and you're just sitting underneath the table like, oh, would he just fuck off? Please, get the next speaker on already. What happens is... What happens is the macro brain goes, all right, you've had enough. Well, oh, I'm busy. I haven't found him yet. Why don't you go over there? Is the player over there? I'm not telling you. Okay. <laughs> and away it goes. And you think, right, thank fuck, right, touch, 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 and you run away. And yeah, like I said, it all actually is based on Left 4 Dead. It's the inverse of the Left 4 Dead system. So it's trying to freak you out. And when it hits a peak in Alien Isolation, the alien leaves. Left 4 Dead does the opposite. It actually tries to stress you out. And it does it on a roller coaster system. So it goes, right, they're not stressed. Let's throw zombies at them. That'll stress them out. And once you're all kind of at a certain level of stress, it'll throw a big bunch of zombies at you. And then it goes, all right, give them a break. And that's why after a big horde of them, you go, oh, thank God, right, hang on. You know, reload the gun and go to get bandages on. And... Oh, right, hang on, we're good. Where's, where's Dave went? And Dave's about 500 meters down the road. He's like, oh, right, we're going to do this. That's the worst thing to do because you're not earning that experience. And that's when the AI goes, oi, what the fuck are you going? <laughs> this, those three are over there. Dave's went over, right? Him. And it will. It's actually temperamental. It will then go, you're fucking getting it, mate. <laughs> and that's why that guy that runs off and you're thinking, oh, no, what's he going to do? Next thing you know, you see the silhouette on the screen because he's got a boomer attack him and then a horde gets him and then a hunter's on him and you're an idiot. It's because he antagonized the system. He's not earning it. 
And yeah, that's really about it. It's just sort of look at these wonderful things that people do to actually have this weird, contentious relationship between players and AI where we're constantly trying to help you but at the same time trying to kill you because that's kind of our job. And yeah, if you're remotely interested in any of that, this is pretty much sort of greatest hits collection of a lot of the videos that I host over on the AI and Games YouTube channel. And yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks for listening.